שלום, ערב טוב לכולם, ודרישת שלום מירושלים. I'll speak in English. My English is not so good, so I'll read it. And excuse my mistakes. Okay. <laughs> and first of all, I would like to express my appreciation and gratitude to Professor David Berger, Dean of Yeshiva University's Bernard Revel Graduate School of Jewish Studies. It's a long name for me, but <laughs> I did it. <laughs> and Associate Dean, Professor Mordechai Korn, who by inviting me here today, are giving me the opportunity to present a significant topic that until now, few have dealt with. I'll open my lecture with this picture of Hungarian rabbis that appears on the flyer for the event. This picture was taken as they got off the train in Auschwitz. The photos come from a collection of photographs called the, Aus the Auschwitz Album. These rare pictures were taken by a German photographer in the spring of 1944. They are extraordinary because photography in concentration camps was generally for forbidden. However, here the Nazis themselves initiated the photos which show the last journey of Hungarian Jews from the town of Bilka. The almost 200 pictures show the whole process of the Jews' arrival in Auschwitz, everything except for the actual murders. It seems that this is the last picture of rabbis of the time in Europe. Let's look for a minute at their faces on this, at the faces of these rabbis. The German photographer caught their dignified expression, hadrat panim, and the dread in their eyes. One can feel that perhaps just at that moment, they grasp what was happening. Dignity shines forth together with the great sorrow of a shepherd for Am Israel, their flock. Looking at the picture, we can ask the first and most obvious question. What is the uniqueness of Hungarian rabbis? Why talk specially about them? Can we isolate them and discuss them separately from other groups of rabbis, such as those from Poland or Lithuania? We can see that the rabbis arrived at the camp in their rabbinical garb, directly or almost directly from their besmedresh, their families, their communities, and from a relatively routine daily life. Rabbis from Poland or Lithuania did not arrive in Auschwitz looking like this. Looking at the timeline, we can understand that Hungarian Jewry had no interim period like the majority of Polish Jewry. The occupation was swift, and just a month later, the mass deportation to Auschwitz started. Thus, both rabbis and communities arrived after almost no stop along the way, except for perhaps a few weeks in a transit camp, often referred to as a ghetto. There are, of course, many parallels that can be drawn between the leadership of Hungarian rabbis in the camps and that of Polish rabbis. But only of a few of the Polish rabbis survived. Many were murdered at the time of the occupation after having undergone abuse. Others died in the ghettos. And the remaining rabbis were led to the crematoria at the selections at the gates of the camps because they were no longer fit for forced labor. In contrast, the Hungarian Jewish community was brought to the camps in mass transports with half a million arriving within eight weeks. Mothers with children, grandparents with grandchildren, at times 70 family members in one cattle car. And the community rabbis Arrived, to, arrived together with them. Obviously, there were rabbis from Hungary whose fate was different, such as those who lived in Budapest during the occupation. 
mainly in internationally protect, protect, uh, protected buildings like the glass house, and others who left on the Kastner train or who escaped to Romania. Each of these groups deserved a separate lecture. In the framework of today's lecture, we will not discuss them. Most of the Hungarian rabbis were deported to Auschwitz and from there to its satellite camps and then to Germany on the death marches or straight from Hungary to labor camp in Austria. This lecture focuses on this group. Here is another picture which belongs to the same series of photo uh, uh, photographs. Today we know who these impressive figures were. Brothers of the Weiss family who belonged to the Hasidic dynasty of Spinka. All of the five Weiss brothers served as community rabbis and were admiringly known as Hamisha Chumshei Torah. A short while after arriving at, the Aus at, the, uh, uh, at Auschwitz, their appearance changed completely as we can see. At the gates of the camp, after being stripped of all their possessions and their clothes, and after being given striped camp clothing, no external remnant of their rabbinical status remained. They were rabbis without Bet Midrash or their Talmud, without their books and their community, without their beard and their dignified appearance. It was impossible to distinguish between them and the other inmates. And because of the special treatment, so to call that rabbis and leaders were subjected to, they concealed their identity and were known only to their close circle. Both pictures reflect the calamity of the Jews and their leaders. Primo Levi described the entrance to the concentration camp as a state of utter deprivation, saying that when a man is deprived of everything he possesses, he become a hollow man, reduced to suffering and needs, forgetful of dignity and restrained, for he who loses all often easily loses himself. He will be a man with no sense of human affinity. Although we do not accept Primo Levi's sweeping generalization, it reinforced our question. Can we identify component of challenged leadership in the new situation where the pre-war challenges were no longer relevant? And then an additional question arises, which, which tools did the Hungarian rabbis use to cope with this? Let's look at a testimony about one of the rabbis from Hungary, Rabbi Tzvi Hirsch Meisels, and through it attempt to start answering this question. This movie deals with the life of Jewish Hungarian boys in Auschwitz. We will focus on the figure of the rabbi. On the face of it, this book looks like any other book. One of the books of halachic responsa that adorn the Jewish bookcase. But its pages are heavier than those of other books. The questions and answers brought in the book occurred in another world, behind the barbed wire of Auschwitz concentration camp. They constitute a halachic source, but at the same time they are a rare testimony the story of Mekatshi Hashem, those who sanctified God's name in our generation. The author, Holocaust survivor Rabbi Tzvi Hirsch Meisels, was one of the prisoners, the forced laborers in the camp, and simultaneously he acted as Poisik and leader. Standing opposite the crematorium, he vowed that if he survived, he would tell the story of those who died for Kiddush Hashem, and he would publish their Torah ideas. Rabbi Meisels is one of the Dayonim of the Weizen community in central Hungary and he was known as a great Torah scholar, Poisik and Rosh Hashiva in Weizen. His reputation spread throughout the Jewish world because of his replies to halachic questions.
All this stopped in March 1944. The sudden and fast invasion of Hungary by the Nazis shook all of Hungarian Jewry, including the Weizen community. The Jews were driven out of their homes to assembly places or packed into local ghettos for a short time. And from there, they were deported to one destination, Auschwitz. The trains rolled on day and night, and within about eight weeks, more than 400,000 Jews were murdered, men, women and children, about half of Hungarian Jewry. Among those sent to Auschwitz were the splendor and fruit of the communities. Thousands of young boys, including yeshiva students from yeshivas throughout Hungary, who were taken straight from their homes and places of study. David Israel was one of the boys destined to live. Knowing how to speak German, he was chosen to work in the gypsy camp, where he was employed in the sick people's block. His work allowed him to look after himself, to save his father and to help other prisoners. One night, he awoke in shock. An unknown figure was standing next to his bunk. A gaunt figure in the striped clothes of Auschwitz, but with flaming eyes. The whole Ihr kennt mir her. Ich will heute gemacht das Sick. Ihr macht das Sick. Ich habe gemacht das Sick. Freig nicht. Ich habe gemacht das Sick. Und ich will, also der Russen mit zwei Brüten verlegen mischen. So, und wann weiß ich, so, man weiß. Man weiß, dass die aus dem Schlüssel. Wo ich da wo die? Russen mit zwei Brüten, und ich suche, dass sie auch nur ein Brecker, geben mal weg. עצות איך להכניס את זה ואיך שזה לא ייפול לי. הוא אומר, אני אצא שלוש פעמים ואתה יורד, הלוא זה כבר סוכות. אין, אין לבנה, ואתה הולך אחריי. נו, מובן, הוא זכר בעל פה הכל, ואני חזרתי אחריו, מעריב, קידוש. הבטיח לי שבזכות המצווה הזאת נשתחרר. עכשיו בוא נחזור, איך הוא היה יכול לעשות סוכה באושוויץ? איך אתה יכול לעשות סוכה באושוויץ? מוט פליצינג גברנגט אין חוצר, הינדה תבט. בסוף מזל מפסרגת סחורב גמרת, זה דוי גמל בית. בית נגבין הזאת גרוי יתיש. Eine Drahstocken, bitte. Die Mitten, finde alle so eine Seine, Jange hat das Ort gebrochen. Die Breite, die Halt, die Spalte nicht. Die macht mit dem Skach, und das ist in der Zicke. Wenn ich mir sage, ich muss die Rabbeine nicht mehr zu lassen, ich muss die Rabbeine nicht mehr zu lassen. Das ist nicht mehr. A few months passed, and the terrible war came to an end. One from a family, and two from a city. Jews gathered in, the, gathered in the DP camps in Germany, searching for a way to a new life. Rabbi Tzvi Hirsch Meisels devoted himself to the issue of Agunas, women whose husbands had disappeared from the war, and was appointed as head of the rabbinical court for Agunas in Bergen-Belsen. He claimed that only someone who was there 
could find ways of permitting these miserable women to remarry, and he turned to rabbis all over the world to treat the matter as urgent. Several years later, he became rabbi of a community in Chicago, and there he published his book, The Makad Shei Hashem Responsa. The lad, David, made Aliyah to Israel, but after a few years moved to Venezuela to his brother, where he too raised the family. קורא לי, אומר, דוד, מחר בערב אני בצלי בבית עושה התי אמת. קבלת פעמים לרב שאני מכיר אותו לפני המלחמה, צדיק ותם. תבוא בבקשה. אמרתי, אני אבא, אני אבוא. אני מגיע לביתו וכבר יושבים איזה עשרים איש, ואני רואה יהודי עם זקן, לבן, עם פיות, והרימה עם ספרים גדולים. הוא מדבר ביידיש ומספר ומספר, הוצאתי ספר, מקדשי השם ואתם יודעים שאני הייתי באושוויץ ואני תקעתי להם שופר ועשיתי סוכה ואיינגלר, מורגהולפן כשאני מתחיל לשמוע את זה, אני מתחיל לראות אני נותן לגמור ואני ניגש אליו, זה אומר דו סינגלר בנך יצחק אבק נושא לך מושג. וזה מה שהוא נתן לי את הספר, וזה כתב ידו. וזה נמצא בסוכתו של הבן שלי כאן בירושלים. אוקיי, זה סטורי is moving and inspiring in its own right, but it also reflects the role of the rabbi when giving halacha ruling פסק. Here we see the rabbinical, rabbinical figure who on the one hand, wants to keep Yiddishkeit alive, to remember that today is Sukkot, and on the other side, rules for others that they are exempt from fulfilling the mitzvot, not only the mitzvah of Sukkah, but other mitzvot too. He didn't let anyone go with him to the Sukkah and tried to prevent the boy David from endangering his life. There are many testimonies showing how Hungarian rabbis in various camps urge their fellow inmates to eat all food, to remember that they were exempt from all the mitzvot as the Torah instructs us in the situation of pikuach nefesh. And it was not a simple matter. The Jews from Hungary displayed extraordinary tenac uh, tenacity or even obstinacy in their efforts to continue observing mitzvot. This phenomenon stemmed not only from their meticulousness in halacha, but from the fact that we mentioned before. They were uh, deported to the camps suddenly and straight from their homes. Observing the mitzvot, even only in a symbolic way, was still a part of their everyday life and later on became an expression of continuity, of connection to their previous life. During the interviews that I conducted for this research, I met the Jewish psychiatrist Thomas Radil from Prague. He relates that the boys from Hungary who were with him in Auschwitz insisted, uh, insists on not putting any non-kosher food into their mouths and avoided eating even soup which contained bones. He, as a non-Orthodox boy, admired their determination. He remembers that one day two rabbis entered their barrack and persuaded the boys to eat anything they could. The rabbis explained that, having, that uh, living was now the most important mitzvah according to the, the Torah and whoever rejected the food and endangered his life helped the Nazis achieve their goal, to starve them to death. The Orthodox boys, that's the story of Thomas Radil, the Orthodox boy found it very difficult to obey, but most of them finally accepted the ruling, thus giving themselves <coughs> more of a chance to survive. <laughs> By the way, from these testimonies, we get important insight concerning Jewish heroism during the Shoah. We are used to thinking that the spiritual heroes were those 
who risk their lives and were ready to die in order to keep a mitzvah or avoid doing an avera, like those who refuse to eat anything non-kosher. This approach caused many religious survivors to hesitate before telling their, that they ate non-kosher food or did not keep Shabbat, Yom Tov, or fast days. They felt that society was still not ready to understand that that too demanded great spiritual strength, that despite their love for mitzvot and their recalling from eating non-kosher, they acted according to the Torah's mitzvah of the Chaybahem. In many cases, the rabbis themselves served as personal <laughs> examples, as the Rambam writes, showing the others how to act. They lit fire on Shabbat when the cold was too, too much to bear. They chopped down trees in the forest in Austria on Shabbat, encouraging those around them that this was the right thing to do, and even a mitzvah. In order to appreciate the significance of the rabbi's new role, and to understand the change they went through, we need to take a look at those same rabbis when they served their communities before the Nazi occupation. Halachic ruling and concern for the observance of the halacha was the most important role of Hungarian rabbi rabbis, the vast majority of whom were the followers of the Talmidim of the Khatam Sofer. The Khatam Sofer was the one who provided the Orthodox community and its rabbis with their unique character and their approach, uh, approach uh, in leadership. He saw in the rabbinate a mission and a purpose, and he provided the rabbinical leadership with significant challenge. The community rabbi was responsible for daily life being conducted according to the halacha, and the Hungarian community was famous for its stringency in halacha and customs. As a result, the response literature shooting of Hungarian rabbis is extensive and their halachic discussions crossed borders. The stringency in halacha also served to reinforce the Orthodox community in its struggle against various trends and against the winds of modernity that were sweeping across Hungary and to create a natural boundary between the Orthodox community and the neolog, the reforms due in Hungary at the time, which in the end received government recognition. The rabbis quickly identified the central challenge of existence in the concentration camp, to survive physically another day, another week, Eberleben, to merit meeting one's family again. Here, one could see the phenomenon of a brave leadership, which made a switch that demanded immense spiritual strength. The halachic ruling became a means, even a weapon, in the fight for the lives of the inmates. And this was not simple transition. It constituted an emotional and fundamental difficulty which required overcoming, overcoming immense barriers, especially when it occurred eating non-kosher food. Yechezkel Harfenes, who was in Auschwitz with his young son, tells on a conversation he had with, with his Rav, Rav Rubin, from Hungary. I told him, Rav Braun, that I did not eat the meat but rather gave it to my son. He answered, if you do this because you think your son needs it more than you, all right, that is your affair. But if you're doing it because you don't want to contaminate yourself, you're nothing but a chassid shota, a sanctimonious fool. You need not feel guilty or even repent over such an act, but rest assured you have not committed any sin by eating such meat. On the contrary, refraining from eating something that can assure your continued existence under the impossible conditions here is an even greater sin, for you are disregarding the commandment to guard yourself exceedingly in Ishmartem, Ma'od, Devarim Dalat Tesvav, from the testimony of Yecheskel Harfenus. The rabbis who had spent their whole lives dealing in the uh, finest details of the halacha and in public struggles for its uh, continued existence 
were now busy explaining and persuading the camp inmates that they were exempt from fulfilling the mitzvot. However, at the same time, there was an additional challenge in the concentration camp, and that was to remain alive as a Jew. Remaining alive as a Jew meant to believe, to remain a human being, remembering who you are and preserving your moral values. Did the rabbis respond to this challenge too? In order to, al to answer, we will return again to the rabbis' other roles before the war, learning and disseminating Torah. One of the things that the Khatam Sofer uh, introduced was that community rabbis open yeshivot in their communities. This was a precondition to their agreeing to serve as rabbis. For this reason, there were hundreds of yeshivot in Hungary. The rabbi was Rosh Yeshiva and disseminator of Torah. In Hungary, there were strict regulations concerning daily Torah study, <coughs> including for Jews who worked. How did this role of Rosh Yeshiva influence their leadership in the concentration camp? This Sifri Kodesh are Torah ideas that were said in the camps by rabbis from Hungary. These are just a few samples that are amazing testimony of the phenomenon of Torah Galtai Ma'em, the Torah that went into exile together with them, even into the world of absolute evil. What is the significance of Torah learning in the camps? Theoretical intellectual study, Limud Be'yun, was impossible in those conditions. But the sound of Torah learning was not silent. Torah ideas were said hastily by word of mouth, in secret, making association with situation or connected to a date or the weekly parsha. There were those who learned Torah while walking, doing forced labor, or when resting on, the, on their bunks, as though life was going on as usual as Eli Wiesel described. I can see us now carrying bags of cement, large stones, pushing wheelbarrows full of sand or clay, and all the time learning halacha from the Mishnah or a page of Talmud. My friend knew it all by heart. Eli Wiesel, All Rivers Run to the Sea, page 82. In some barracks, Jews discussed the Torah after work, holding a daily shiur, so to speak. These shiurim were taught by rabbis like Rabbi Meisels and Rabbi Yoshua Greenwald of Chust. Rabbi Eliyahu Dormant from Budapest wrote, Scholars from Pressburg, Pupa, Sarvar, from many places, we sat at one table every night like brothers, discussing the laws of Choriv as best we could. Rabbi Eliyahu Doman, Budapest Buchenwald. A unique source is a collection of Torah ideas called Lahag Yekudei Esh. I'll explain this title shortly. This Divrei Torah were preserved by Rabbi Avraham Meir Israel, Rabbi of Hunyad. He was deported to Auschwitz, to Buchenwald, and then to a satellite camp of Buchenwald. The living conditions of the inmates were terribly difficult, and they were murdered in stages. In the last weeks of the war, they were sent on the death march to Theresienstadt. On the long journey, Rabbi Israel met other Torah scholars from Hungary. He mentioned 22 of them by name. They used to tell each other and other Jews Torah ideas from Psukim and Midrashim, giving them, giving them current interpretations. Most of the ideas were said from memory, and the reader can only be amazed by the fresh thoughts and creativity of what was said. Rab Israel relates that he obtained a pencil from a Ukrainian in exchange for a piece of bread and that, and that he used sacks of cement as paper. Together with Rabbi Yosef May Rubin, he hid the notes in the barrack of the dead and the pages <coughs> gradually piled up. They even managed to preserve them on the death march. Unfortunately, out of the 22 rabbis, only three survived. But the pages <laughs> survived. <coughs> Rabbi Israel called the book Lahag Yekodei Esh, 
Paraphrasing the expression from the Piyut of Kedusha of Rosh Hashanah, when the angels are called Lahak in Kuf, a choir of those who are on fire. In Hebrew, Lahak with Gimel means talk, discussion. So the title means the discussion, Divrei Torah, of those who went up in flames. <coughs> the rabbi noted the date and the location where the ideas were said and was careful to state who said each piece. As we mentioned, this is a rare and unique book because all of it consisted of ideas said in the concentration camp and was written there. It allows us to understand how this style of Torah learning became a means of spiritual leadership. Rav Nossan Nata Lemberger, the young Rav of Makov. We arranged for the children who did not go out to work to study Mishnah and the Parsha with Rashi. They were taught by my friend Rav Avram Baruch Bells, a highly respected rabbi in our city of Makov. The elderly men and women recited Tehillim every day. We worked particularly assiduously and took upon ourselves to complete their daily quota so that they could all stay behind in the camp. That was in uh, a family camps in Austria. Of course, it can't be in Auschwitz, families and children and so on. Um, and the list goes on and on. Many rabbis who survived the Holocaust wrote down their memories and their Torah ideas that they said in the camps in the prefaces to, the, to Sifrei Kodesh that they published. By the way, in Michlala Yerushalayim, we built a database of these texts, more than 150 texts of memoirs of Rabbanim, who, uh, which, which was written in the prefaces of their books. Uh, we have it in our site, Zachor, Zachor Emunah B'Mea Shoah. You can see most of them. As I said, at the beginning of the lecture, we also have testimonies of Polish rabbis who had Torah discussions. But the majority of the sources that survived are from the Hungarian rabbis. Rabbi Yekutil Yehuda Halberstam of Kloisenburg represent another, represent a, another group of rabbis, those that stood at the head of the Hasidic courts in areas that were annexed to Hungary. He used to say Divrei Torah every Shabbat at the time of Seudash Lishit, and as he had no head covering, he covered it with the edge of his striped clothing or with his blanket. And he would learn Gemara uh, for memory on his way to forced labor, as it says, when, keep, the, when people came across pages of Gemara or Shulchan Aruch, there was no end to their joy, and they learned from them over and over again. As for e examples, it we told by Professor David Halivni. Uh, our question is, can we find a connection between the context of their learning and the horrific reality of daily life in the camps? We always try to strengthen our trust in God. Each time we returned from work, we sat on the floor discussing the Torah, saying things that would strengthen our faith, telling stories about the righteous, and studying Mishnah orally. It was a real lifesaver. We saw with our own eyes day after day that those who fell into the net of despair could not last more than a few days. To this day, many of them are grateful to me for this. Rabbi Yoshua Grunwald of Chust. After uh, researching the sources, it can be said that the rabbis managed to draw from the psukim a few directions of thought. The most important one was to encourage the belief that Hashem had not left them and to trust in the coming salvation. Another important, important idea was a call for ethical behavior by the interpretations of Pesukim and Midrashim. For example, as we saw, Rab Israel brought an interpretation of the Mishnah, Kol Ma De Avid Rachmana Letav Avid. He explained that it means that everything that Hashem does, it's so that we will become better. He explains the Mishnah as a call to see in the situation a challenge, to withstand the trials which were meant to make us better people. And this impressive call was said when around them, the Nazis and their collaborators destroyed all 
moral rules of humanity with a totally evil ideology. The Divrei Torah also show how the verses of the Torah reflect the events which are hinted at, uh, hinted at in the Torah. In this way, they granted meaning to the ev events. This wasn't a word of chaos, rather a word anchored in the holy books which just had to be discovered. Sometimes the verses were used as a way of coping with difficult questions. One of them was the question of the Jewish people as a chosen nation. Thousands of Hungarian Jews arrived at the camps on the eve of Shavuot, on that very day when we became the chosen people. What is the meaning of being a chosen nation at that place, at that time? In addition, the Pasuk Torah Chasha Ashu'ai found concrete expression in the style that became common in the camps occupying themselves with hints in the written words, with gematriot, riddles, humorous or ironic interpretations and quotes. We can see how Torah learning fulfilled more than the mitzvah of learning, but also became a tool for the main challenges in the camps. This phenomenon allows us to understand the uniqueness of learning Torah in the camps in contrast to other cultural texts. This was study that had a direct effect on the inmate's life and behavior. John Amory, the philosopher who survived Auschwitz, once asked his, this question to a Jew who was discussing Torah ideas. The latter's response was, you have to admit one thing, that your intelligentsia and education have no value here. Value here. In contrast, I have the cert certainty that God will take revenge of us. We have touched on two spheres in which the rabbis had influence in the concentration camps. However, there is another important sphere, the figure of the rabbi as a model of faith and ethical behavior. In routine times, the rabbi stood above the community or his Hasidim as a role model in his way of life. During the great crisis of the Shoah, his personality still influenced his close circle strongly and meaningfully. In the next testimony, now I need, I really need the computer. <laughs> okay, okay, let's hope. <laughs> okay. In the testimony, Emir Tzashem to come, <laughs> we will hear and see Holocaust survivors who were close to the Kloisenburg Rebbe. We made a new film about the Kloisenburg Rebbe. We had the schut to interview survivors who were with him in the long way. And I'll show you that some of them speaking about the Rebbe in the concentration camp. The first one is a Litvak who never met a Hasidic Rebbe. Uh, the second is Hungarian, the father of the well-known Reb Osher Weiss from Yerushalayim. Yesterday was the shiva of this man, which will, who, who will uh, see soon. Uh, I heard about it, and I went to them last week, and I told them that I'm going to lecture about him, him and to see him. So, and Reb Osher said shiva till, till yesterday. Uh, <coughs> Then we'll see another uh, testimonies. Okay? Uh, the, the, the other is uh, recorded at, at the uh, cornerstone laying ceremony for the Laniado Hospital in Netanya, Israel. An injury to a person at that time was almost a, de a death sentence. But with the Rebbe's private suffering served as a trigger for the, for the great challenge of building the Laniado Hospital. This is a manif manifestation mm -hmm. on leadership. Maybe I, I'm a little uh, excited because of the film, so excuse me again. Okay. Uh, may, uh, this is a manifestation of leadership responsibility, looking ahead into the future, 
Similarly, but in a different context, Rabbi Tzvi Hirsch Meisers writes that as he was standing up opposite the crematoria, he, it occurred to him how to release Agunot after the Shoah from what he saw with, with uh, his own eyes. We read it already. Primo Levi and Viktor Frankl had two very different perspectives on the effect of Auschwitz on the inmates. Frankl emphasizes the free choice that was not lost in any situation. He claims that there were always opportunities for choice, while Primo Levi, who was in the same place, Auschwitz III, at the same time, the summer of 1944, sees a process of losing the human image, bestialization, and doesn't believe that spiritual values operated in the concentration camps. However, the responses of Hungarian rabbis, some of whom were also there in the same month, support Frankel's approach. One of the Rabbi Zvi Hirsch Meisel choices was to blow the shofar on Auschwitz on Rosh Hashanah 1944, Tafshin Hay. Until a few years ago, there were uh, those who denied that this event took place, saying that it's not possible in this totally closed and uh, threatening camp. However, I found about 30 testimonies which prove that what Rabbi Meisel wrote really happened. הגיע כבר, ברוך השם, קרוב לשבועות. אנחנו שומעים שמגיע טרנספורט מהונגריה. היות שאני עבדתי בתוך המחנה, כשהגיע הטרנספורט, הלכתי לראות, ואחד אני מכיר, תקר מיד רואה, זה, זה, זה ההתנהגות שלו לגמרי אחרת. אני שואל, שמדברים עוד איזה, שאומרים, דריד, 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 זה הרבה, 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 אני בטור, אני טעי, לא חמד, לא יודע כמה, אני עובר יום, יומיים, אני צוף, אני הולך לראות, אני רואה את היהודי הזה, ואומרים לי, אומר לי, אומר לי, פחי, אס, בוס אסטר, יחס נורא בוס. ‫משחקים נסיק לברויט. ‫אתה המבושל, לא. ‫אז כמה שיכולת, כמה שיכולת ‫לקחת בכיס, ‫הבאת לרבה. ‫אני שמרתי לו, ‫שאני למדתי ביתר בישיבה, ‫אז אומר לי, דרבה, ‫קום אינדפרי, ‫תבוא בבוקר זה וזה, ‫אני אתן לך להניח תפיל. ‫שכבר שלוש שנים, ‫יותר משלוש שנים שאני לא מתאר, ‫לא מתאר, לא יודע מה זה תפיל. ‫אני לא יכול לתאר את השמחה. ‫שנח את התפיל, ‫נתן לי את התפיל להניח, ‫ביתי גבול חיבי לקח מכאן. ‫רק להניח, צאו אלמן. ‫כל אלו שהיה על קסם הרבי ישפיע. ‫הרבי נתן להביט כל כך, ‫הוא אמר, ‫הנה, הנה, הנה, סתר צריך דיגולי קרובה. ‫הוא נתן עידוד מאוד, ‫הוא מאוד עידוד, מאוד עד, למרות... ‫אז הם יוצאים. ‫יום מלאפין לקח את הרבה ‫מקלוזנברג. 
הוא אמר לרבי כך, רבי, תורות זה כלי עבודה, אבל עיר, עיר בית פרונס, עיר דם בית פרונס רחמים, עיר של טון דרבט, עיר דפנה הלט בכלי עבודה, אם בא, אם בא, אם בא, אז ככה, מה עושים? דפנה, אתם צריכים רק להזיק את הכלי עבודה, אבל העיר הרבית היא, אתה בנו שלך, דם ונתנר על פי פלירמין, קח את זה, קח את זה, ביום מלאפין. וככה זה היה כל הזמן, כל החורף, הרבי עבד אצל ביום מלאפין, והרבי כל החורף אמר, אין שטרקצך, אין שטרקצך, דיגוי לקרובה, דיגוי לקרובה. בא חנוכה, גוי לקרובה, רבי, שזה תוקף גולה, חנוכה. בא פורים, אותו הדבר, רבי, רבי זוקסו, דיגוי לקרובה, עיר זוקסו, דיגוי לקרובה, עיר זוקסו, אני לא אומר את הגוי לקרובה, אני אומר את הגוי לקרובה. רבי, אל זוק תראו לנו, סינגו כמו לא דיגוי לה. עוד אין, היא כבר חנוכה, היא כבר פורים, דיגוי לנוכניתו. ואחרי פורים משנה הרבה את הנוסח. במקום גאולה, פסח אמר, יש מה זה שם. אני אומר לכם, חמישה ימים לפני פסח, בא אברונים, לא עשרות, מאות אברונים, אנחנו רואים, בתך המחנה, בל נגר. הם שורקים את הפצצות, רואים, איזה שמחה. השומרים והגויים הגרמנים הם בורחים, אבל אנחנו שמחים. למחרת לקחו את היהודים מוולדנגר ואנחנו הולכים. הכניסו רכבת של, של קרנות של בהמות, שתי אס-אס בכל קרון, בצד זה שלושים יהודים, בצד זה שלושים. ממש אחד על שני. מי שעומד, הם יורים. פעם אחת, הקרוז ברוף עמד, מה שנשכזי צנגית, לא ישב שם, עמד. ירה, ונכנס כדור מצד זה ויד יצא מצד זה. אותי שירים, אותי שירים כנקרכט. לא, אני הייתי שתי אנשים ממנו. לא הרגשתי שהוא נפצע. הוא לקח משהו וסגר את זה. מחר בבוקר הוא אמר לי, וייסט, אז... זה מותקן טרד נביס לזה, שתירא הייט. הוא אמר לי, אתה יודע שכואב לי. מה, הוא אמר לי, זה התרפא ככה, מי עלה? Now we'll go back to the show for blowing in Auschwitz. This is the second story of, uh, about our Mavlich, and we will discuss this event separately. Uven kolot habechi vat fila, hapreda va akev, nishma berosh hashana be Auschwitz, gam kolo shel shofar. Plitzling, alim tzvaya zayge, tiyel finimten in Schweiz, Wer es will her ne Schäufer bloß und soll rausgehen. Wer geht raus? Ja, es kann ne rausgehen mit dem. Ich bin ja rausgegangen. Aber der Minner Meizer, der es besiegen muss, man sucht fast Schäufer bloß, man schreit, gedenke ich noch plötzlich sehr, der weiße ne Ruf, in der Gemeinde, in der Mensch noch, auch mit seinem Sinn. Noch heuer mit Keule, Keule, Minner Meizer, Grüße, Kau, 
in unserer Geschockel, die ich noch genommen habe, etwas als Strick, und das ist ein Gebinde wie ein Gattel, wie ein Gattel, ohne Boden, und passt jeder, wenn du geschehen ist, Gatt. Keizad ist sie gerade der Schofar, lo ra ich. Minein lakach et ha-tuzah la-avor ben ha-zrifim, ולתקוע בשופר, לא יבין איש. Et geblut in dem Rechishun, ech ma, zehner, te tini du in dort, et geblut soife. Bati le-zrif, sipru li, shaya mishu, et la shetaka bashofar. אמרתי, אוי, אני רצתי בצריף, אורך הצריפים, חשבתי שאני אפגוש אותו באיזה צריף, אבל לא מצאתי אותו כי אנחנו עם הצריף האחרון. אמרתי, וואי, ככה תקעו שופר באושוויץ ואני לא שמעתי. תתת גזוקתא, לא מכרה אמבלות נשואף, וכשתנא דתיר השוי מגן היית. זוג תיירו צריך לא דחרה, אבל בתומי קלינקמן, אז הקימה דה זמן המפיר נבחבק דקינדר, כן שנמר שרות גיין. ‫שוי, תת חנוכי גבית, ‫איך דוד השטיין, ‫תומא זה אחד החבר'ה מלאך הבול כמנון, ‫איך הגבית ווסביר שטץ כאן, ‫צלי מזה... ‫ברוך נשגפול, כי זה רעג יגעג, ‫תוד גזוק, ובין דמאס. ‫-one can see that this event ‫remains a most meaningful event ‫in their lives and in their struggle ‫to retain their Jewish identity. ‫אבל this amazing event of the Shofar ‫אולסו רפלקט אקומפלקס פנומנון. ‫זהו רבייס, ‫הוא היה אינפלואנס ‫על their surroundings ‫בי בינג סטרינג'נט על themselves, ‫whether with regards to תפילין, ‫פאסטינג על יום כיפר, ‫אצט שווה, ‫אבן זו זה יעול to other to be lenient, ‫אז we saw in the סוכה ‫אוף רבי מייזלס. ‫וואי דיד זה... ‫דביאט פרום הלכיק פריימוורק ‫טו זה אקסטנט אוף אינדג'רינג זהו לייב. ‫זה סיים קווישן ‫כן בי אסק און אודינרי ג'וז, ‫הוא דיד נאט בהייב ‫אז זה תורה אינסטרקט ‫אין טיימס אוף לייב סוויטנינג דנג'ר. ‫אני פאונד ‫זאת זיס דילמה ‫בודרד זה רע בייף דמסלף פור איז. ‫וואי דיד זה דו איט? ‫וואי דיד זה דו איט? ‫אנד זה גייב סאם אקספשנס In their, to their thoughts. There were those who noted that mitzvah observance and even remembering the mitzvah created a feeling of bonding with the shame and thereby strengthened them in the struggle for life. Rabbi Lemberger explained the risk he took lightening Hanukkah candles during forced labor in Vienna. Who thought if according to the halacha ‫אנחנו היינו חייבים להתחיל את עצמנו ‫באמת מתחילת סיטואציה. ‫אבל בימים ובימים כאלה, ‫יש איזשהו סוג של אינטרנט דרייב ‫לעשות דברים ‫שאין דאוקלי ‫הכנסת רגע ווייטליות. ‫מיץ ואובסרבנס, ‫אפילו אם רק סימבולית, ‫היה סיבוב של ספיריטואל רזיסטנס. ‫היא הכנסת תחושים של ויקטורי ‫של היהודי הספירית. which the enemy could not completely take away, and a feeling of protection in contrast to the helplessness that had been forced upon them. Rabbi Meisels explained the special bond to the mitzvah of tefillin. The pasuk says, V'ra'ita et achorai. Hashem showed Moshe the note of the tefillin. That means that even in the exile, and even in Auschwitz, where, where, where we can't see Hashem face kivyechol, ‫אבל פלו ג'וס הוא לייט פילין, ‫ואנזרבי will be connected to השם. ‫רב מייזלס also wrote another reason. ‫זה טרוס must be written. ‫זה אבוב דיסיזן to blow the shofar ‫was not according to the halacha. ‫האבר, the main reason for my decision ‫at that moment was that anyway ‫I didn't value my life. ‫אין טרוס, this reasoning too ‫has no basic in the halacha. That his word. In an uh, unusual opportunity towards the end of his life, Rav Meisels explained his approach. He, it was when he was uh, hospitalized and the doctor insisted that he eat non-kosher food that was essential for his recuperation. 
He absolutely refused, claiming that if he had avoided non-kosher food in the concentration camps, then there was no way he would be ready to defile himself now. However, after thinking the matter over, he changed his mind, explaining that during the war, and even afterwards, he saw that they had no chance, no chazoka, that they would continue to live. And therefore, they were not obligated to fulfill the halacha of pikuach nefesh. But in his present situation, he had a chance of living and was therefore obligated to make every effort to preserve his body and soul and eat whatever he could to regain his health. These extraordinary deeds reflect their feeling for the mitzvot, an expression of ahava mekalkelet et ashura. Deep love allowed one to go beyond what was expected, and it had an uh, immediate effect on the surroundings. Besides being concerned for the rabbi's welfare, the inmates look on him with admiration, uh, uh, admiration seeing in his deeds an expression of deep Jewish heroism which reconnected them to what they knew from home and reminded them what their ultimate goal was. Here we can see uh, the uh, challenges that they took upon themselves by the halacha, by the Torah, and as a model of faith and ethical behavior. Uh, here is the Klosenburger Rebbe, okay, a role model of a leader. And now um, we are coming here. Can we see in these rabbis a model of leadership in times of crisis? According to, uh, to sociological definitions, such leaderships... According to sociological definitions, a leader should have the ability to understand changing circumstances, transform his tools in order to withstand the new challenges and head towards the ultimate goal, balance sentimental considerations with rational ones, and reach decisions, even ones that include risking lives. The Hungarian rabbis who, ca who came from their communities attempted to cope with the most severe challenges ever faced by a rab. They adapted the tools they were familiar with to the new reality with courage and uh, in a consistent manner. When Moshe Rabbeinu was required to appoint a leader in his stead, he turned to Hashem, calling him Kel Elokei Aruchot, asking that the leader should be one who can go in the spirit of each and every person. It seems that the voice of this verse can be heard in the Torah ideas and halachic ruling of the rabbis during the Shoah. In order to uh, complete the picture, mention should be made of the special role of Hungarian rabbis among the survivors of the Shoah and their confrontation with challenges after liberation. The, the Jewish vibrant world was destroyed. No more whole families, no more communities, total physical and spiritual destruction. In the DP camps, the majority of rabbis were from Hungary. They took upon themselves the task of reviving the Jewish people. It was they who established special courts to deal with the problems of Agunot of the Shoah, like we see, and like Rabbi Hillel Lichtenstein, of course, no. Uh, <coughs> it was they who established a commit, com committees of rabbis who concerned themselves with reviving Jewish life, and they undertook new challenges when they uh, immigrated and assumed rabbinical duties in communities where the atmosphere and the, uh, and the education were far from what they had been used to. In Israel, in the States, from Chicago to New York, in Canada, South Africa, etc. But that is another topic. Perhaps the most outstanding of the surviving Hungarian rabbis was the Rebbe of Klosenburg, who recognized that the continuation of Jewish tradition and education was a cornerstone for the rehabilitation of our people. With his immense love for all Jews and with his great initi uh, 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 initiatives, he brought many hearts back to life. At the same time, he rebuilt the life of the community. 
he established the Sherry Plata Fund, and after a few years, established the great project, a, a, a great project such as the Worldwide Mif al Shas, the Tzans Kloisenburg uh, communities, the neighborhoods in Israel, and the Laniado Hospital. I would like to end my lecture with two testimonies about the Rebbe. One is given by Rebbe Weiss, the mother of Osher Weiss, who was a young girl doing the Shoah. And the other is by an American soldier, Lieutenant Birnbaum, who was one of the first to meet the Rebbe after the liberation. We should pay attention to the elements of leadership that stand out in these testimonies. They reflect the same fears and challenges which we have pointed out during this lecture. שהגענו לפרמלד, שם היו בערך 200 בנות שנמשכו, כולם יתומות שנמשכו אל הרבי, אלו שרצו יהדות להמשיך. כן, הרבי מקלוזנבורג היה נוהג ללמוד לפני הבחורות אולי פעם בשבוע חימיש, לפנות בוקר ממש. אם היינו מוכנים בשש בבוקר, הוא היה מאחורי וילון לא מלמד אותנו. אני אהבתי את השיעורים האלה. הכל, בגלל שלא ידעתי כלום, אז אהבתי ללמוד כל מה שיש. הוא הסתובב במחנה פרנוולד. והיה לו השגחה פרטית על כל המחנה. תאמין שהיה לה משהו קשה על הלב ודיברה איתו, כן. to the Kozenberg Rebbe, and he asked me the same question. Have you got kosher tefillin? I said, I hope that kosher, my mother bought it for me when I was, when I was going to be my mitzvah. And I've had these tefillin since then. He took out the tefillin, I showed it to him. And he said, well, you see, we want to put on tefillin, but where in Germany are you going to get kosher tefillin? We're looking forward for someone to bring us a kosher pet tefillin. Can you bring the tefillin tomorrow morning? And I said, uh, surely I can, after I dabble up being my tefillin. How early do you want them? He says, early the better, because everyone wants to make a bracha on tefillin. They didn't make a bracha since they were in the concert, start of the concentration camp. The next morning, I dabbled early ran to the camp and uh, gave the Klosenberger Rebbe my tefillin. He put the tefillin on with tears in his eyes and just said Kriya Shema and took the tefillin off because there was a lineup. I don't know how many people were in the line, I'd only be guessing, but there were quite a few people that wanted to put tefillin on and make a bracha. The Kozumi Rebbe, picture this, stood with a watch and said, as each pair person wanted to put on tefillin, each man wanted to put on tefillin, tefillin, it's the man, look to your shema, now say to your shema. 
They said, Kriya Shema, take the tefillin off. The tefillin were never wrapped up even. You know, you're supposed to wrap the tefillin after you finish. Next person put on the tefillin. Next person put on the tefillin. Well, it took about from an hour to an hour and a half before everyone had the rounds of making the bracha. That's the story of my tefillin. This is the pair of tefillin that all these people wore. I don't think anyone has, has a pair of tefillin that so many people made brachas on. Thank you very much. <laughs> It's a big schut to learn about these Kedoshim. And we should hear only Besorot Tovot from Am Yisrael. So um, the, the plan was that we would have questions until 9. Uh, that leaves us about 6 minutes. Uh, <laughs> and uh, you know, I'm not prepared to say that we shouldn't do it because there are only 6 minutes. So I'm inviting questions. Ivrit. Okay, it's, it's shorter. Okay, yeah, I'll start. <laughs> את הזכרת שהרבנים מליטה, מפולנדיה, רק לא הצלחנו לדעת עליהם, או זה לא יעבור לי? שני דברים. קודם כל... כן. קודם כל, אין לנו הרבה חומר עליהם. הרבנים מליטה... נהרגו בהתחלת המלחמה, רוב הרבנים נהרגו בפוגרום עוד לפני שנכנסו לגטו. מעטים מאוד נשארו, מכל רבני קובנה, קובנה הייתה מלאה רבנים. רב באופן רשמי נשאר אחד, הרב סנייג, ועוד כמה תלמידים מישיבות. אין לנו פשוט, לא נשאר חומר עליהם. הם לא נשלחו כמעט למחנה ריכוז. הם נהרגו בפורט, בפורט הרביעי, השביעי וכולי וכולי וכולי. הרבנים מפולין הגיעו למחנות, אבל הם הגיעו אחרי שנה וחצי של גטו, של רעב. הקהילה כבר הייתה שבורה, הם היו שבורים, אוקיי. זאת אומרת, היה להם תפקיד כשלעצמו, אבל אין את המושג של רב שמגיע עם הקהילה. גם יהודי פולין לא נשלחו כולם. זה תהליך, של, תהליך ארוך של סלקציה ועוד סלקציה. כך, אם, אם אנחנו רוצים לדבר על מנהיגות, לבדוק את זה בתור מנהיגות, קשה לנו לעשות את זה עם הרבנים האלה, זה לא אומר שזה לא היה, כן? זה אומר שקשה לנו לעשות את זה באופן אחר. Uh, your work seems to be mostly concerned with uh, talking about the religious responses of uh, people in, in the Holocaust to what was going on. Um, do you get the sense that there is a stigma in the academic world against uh, uh, you know, looking at religious uh, responses to the Holocaust is valid, and uh, if so, what do you think is behind that, and do you think that motivates your work in any way? Uh, say again the yeah. last sentences, please. Um, and do you think that motivates your work in any way? Of course. I, I have dialogue. I have a lot of discussions with historians. Uh, I, I, am, uh, I am a part of, con of a con a conference, and uh, last week, I, uh, we have a concern for Professor Michman, and they ask this question. The weeks to come, we have a conference <coughs> with Shem Olam. I, I deal with these uh, topics because no one before did it. I would like to write about Yerushalayim, Ira Kodesh, the Geula, but I feel like a mission because I have the historian tools, because I learned history. And I learned is with the most uh, left historian, Professor Yuda Bauer, yes? But he encouraged me to do it, call as man. And I, and I have the tools of halacha because my husband, when I have a problem in this field, he's learning it with me. Otherwise, I will not write the chapters of halacha. I didn't learn Gemara as in Yeshiva University, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, we thought that together we have the opportunity, we have the mission to do it together. And that's what I'm dealing with this. Um, sometimes people are asking questions 
not from the brain, but from the baton, you know. God. Emotional, and I understand them, bimyuchad if they are second generation. I'm trying to answer, but I can say that I, him, I myself also have questions. It's a tkufa of hester panim. We don't have tshuvot in, the, in that time. So that's what I'm trying to do. Um, the time uh, has arrived. Uh, and um, I, uh, I am uh, at a loss, really, as to quite what to say at the end of this. Uh, I am allergic to use expressions about human beings that originated with God or about God, but I uh, can only say about this presentation and uh, uh, Mrs. Farbstein that la dumiyata uh, la. I, uh, I think that silence is probably the best uh, way to comment on this extraordinary presentation. Thank you. Thank you.